Shalom. Thank you for listening to this week's message from Emmaus Road Fellowship, where we encounter Yeshua in the scriptures. Check out our website at walkingemmausroad.org, where you'll find additional teachings and information on visiting us in Kingwood, Texas. If you've been blessed by this ministry, please consider giving to support Emmaus Road's mission of spreading the good news of the kingdom. May God grant you shalom in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. All right, so this week we're moving into Ve'et Hanan, the second portion in the book of Deuteronomy. And so within with this portion, okay, so the message today is along the lines of this is the way. Now for everybody who thought about the Mandalorian, it's, I know very little about it, so I, I can't go very far other than I know that's something you said there, and there's something about a baby Yoda who's not really baby Yoda. That's about it. Okay, so uh, that about, <laughs> good thing that's not the message, but the message, <laughs> the message is this is the way. So what is the way? All right. And, and the reason why this stood out to me so much is I was reading Deuteronomy 5.30, and in the scriptures there, it says, actually, it's 5.30 in the uh, Jewish numbering of the, of the text. If you're looking it up in a Christian Bible, I believe it's 5.32 or 33. Not sure. Um, but it says, on the enti- you shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. And what stood out to me was on the entire way. So this is all the way, but it's Behol Haderek. In all the way, you shall walk. You shall go as God has commanded you. So that stood out. And, you know, within this portion, there's Moses gave theoretically three speeches in this one portion. If, you, if I hadn't said that he gave three speeches, you might read it all and say, wow, that is a lot of information. I keep hearing over and over, these are the commands, these are the uh, judgments, these are the precepts, do them. Uh, and you'd have all kinds of, a whole collection of storylines. And you may not really know how to put them together. It's, it's kind of a, a tough portion to read in, in some ways. But Aleph Beta, uh, the team over there, actually it's, yeah, Aleph, Aleph Beta, they, uh, they had a summary of this portion, and what they found within it was that the use of you shall listen to God's commandments and his judgments and do them followed a pattern where it would introduce a portion of the scripture, and then it would conclude it. And then it would again reintroduce another one and conclude that. And there were three sets of that in this week's portion. And they have a uh, detailed video on that if you ever want to check that out. I'm not going to go into all of that. Instead, I'm going to give you kind of the high-level summary of what these three sections were. And the first one was in Deuteronomy 4. And within Deuteronomy 4, destiny is the primary theme of what are the children of Israel headed to and what is their purpose? What what will their path be on the course of reaching their destiny? Deuteronomy 5 primarily deals with Moses retelling the Ten Commandments and highlighting the covenant. So the Various aspects of the covenant are central to the second one. And then lastly was Deuteronomy 6 and carrying over into Deuteronomy 7, which spoke a lot, well, actually includes the Shema, right? The declaration that God is one and that we have faith in the one true God, followed by the Ve'ahavta, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, right? And it's speaking of the love that we're to have the, of the one true God and the communion, the fellowship that we have with him. So oneness and love being this series of this third set. And as I was thinking on these three topics, I began to see a little bit of a progression, okay? Because if you recall, what's happening is that 
the children of Israel are in the last days of Moses' life. They're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And Moses is retelling them many of the commandments, introducing others, and helping them to remember God's faithfulness along the way so that they can be ready and prepared to go and take the land to conquer the giants and to head into this new era. And I thought about a, a progression here from Deuteronomy 4 through 7. If we took a look at the first message, it was issues of, of destiny and where you're headed, how God is calling the children of Israel and saying, this is where I'm going to take you. I'm going to bring you to the place of the promise. But then how do you get there and how do you keep it? And how you get there and how you keep it is walking in covenant faithfulness with God. So remember, these are, the, these are the commands that he gave you along the way that you would live by them so that you would prosper and that are for your good. And then ultimately coming to the place of oneness and love with God into a place of deep relationship with him. And I thought about even how that's a, a picture of really the, the call of salvation that God gives, right? He says, here's who I say you are and what your destiny is. Even though you sit in darkness, I'm going to shine a light on you. I'm going to call you out of darkness and bring you out of that place. Your destiny is to receive the inheritance of life with me. Now, the way that you go and take hold of that and prosper within it is to walk in covenant faithfulness according to the ways that I've set forth that are, represent the truth of my word and of my character. And then from that place of recognizing the heights to which God has called you and the way in which he's called you to walk in covenant faithfulness with him, then you grow in love and unity with him each step along the way. It's not just to know, hey, he, he's called you, he's, he's, he has a plan and purpose for you. Okay, it's wonderful, that's exciting, that's great news. But there has to be some way in which you're going to go forward and take hold of that calling. And that's walking in the faithfulness of covenant, all for the pursuit of knowing God better. And so that's the progression here of really going from a place of lack to a place of fullness. And <clears throat> this week, this Shabbat is Shabbat Nachamu, the, sh the Sabbath of consolation. It too has elements of a progression from exile to redemption. And so it, it kind of follows the same theme of what I was talking about, themes of salvation, of being going from loss to, to life. Uh, and in this case, for Shabbat Nachamu, we're looking at a theme of going from exile to redemption. And what I mean by that is that earlier this week, we observed Tisha B'Av, right? The, the day that remembered, that was a remembrance of the bad report of the spies, of the destruction of the temple, both the first and the second, and many other atrocities through time. And that, that was the ninth of Av, was the culmination of three weeks of affliction that all began at the 17th of Tammuz. And so you had three weeks of affliction, and now we've, we've passed the ninth of Av, we're coming out of that, we're moving into seven weeks of consolation leading up to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the new year. Okay? And all of our Haftarah readings during these seven weeks are going to come from the book of Isaiah, specifically from chapters 40 and on in the book of Isaiah. And it's, it's a little bit odd to have seven straight readings from one book. But it's another thing that's strange about this period is that during these whole 10 weeks, the three weeks of affliction and the seven weeks of consolation, the Heftara readings are not well, they're, they're not intended to be connected to the Torah portion. And what I mean by that is in all of the other Torah, Torah portions, the Heftarah, the reading from the, from the prophets, was selected because it had at least one theme or connection to what the prophet writing, the, the, between the Torah portion and the prophet writing. Okay, so there was always a connection between them. But in, the, in these 10 weeks, there's not 
any intended connection. Instead, the three weeks, the, the heftara for the three weeks of affliction are all reflecting times in which the warnings were being given about the destruction of the second temple. That's because after the destruction of the second temple, the sages said, you know what, let, let's let that be the focus of our hearts during this time of affliction, remembering what was it that caused the destruction of the temple, and then how do we turn that around into something that's going to be, be bringing life out of it. And then we move into the seven weeks of consolation. The seven weeks of consolation are saying, even though the time of exile and destruction has come, there is yet hope. There is yet hope, and it's all building up in these seven weeks and leading into a new beginning, which is the new year. It's the sounding of the trumpet. One day, the coronation of the king, followed by the day of judgment and the time of God's dwelling with man at Sukkot. Right? So these seven weeks are really gearing up for the expectation of a change, the expectation of a redemption. And so it's a time of comfort after a time of trial. Now, I noted a few moments ago that they only chose Heftar readings during the seven-week period from Isaiah 40 and on. It's because at Isaiah 40, there's a, there's a turn in the way Isaiah was writing. And if you read Isaiah 40 and on, it's all comfort consolation, hope of redemption. And so the sages actually call the book of Isaiah the book of consolation. Now, if you read the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, you'd be hard-pressed to call it the book of consolation <laughs> because it is more of a wake-up call, more of a warning of what's to come. But even with the first 39 chapters being more of a rebuke and a wake-up call, the hope that is found in Isaiah 40 and on is so overwhelming and so much greater than the trial that the sages could call the book of Isaiah a book of, of entirely of consolation. It's a beautiful picture to think of, right? That the redemption that is coming is so much greater than the exile that has been. There's a hope and an encouragement in that. And so again, we have this concept coming here of the progression from exile to redemption. And I want to start out reading here in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 1, opens up with, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low, and uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall, shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." Okay. Now, I had just told you that these Heftara readings were not chosen because they were connected to the weekly portion. But I do see some connections in just these first five verses to this week's portion. Now, Deuteronomy 4 speaks very much about the process of exile and redemption. In fact, in Verses 27 through 31 of Deuteronomy 4, the scripture says, And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. This is at, okay, so Moses is telling them that God is going to bring them into the land and they will benefit from homes they didn't build, cisterns they didn't dig, vineyards they didn't plant. He says, But then you're going to forget. You're going to forget God's faithfulness. You're going to forget his call and you're going to go your own way. And when you've done that, God will, this is where we pick up, once you have gone your own way, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But from there, 
you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So he's, he's saying that there will be a redemption that will come after the scattering, after the exile. That's kind of a broad connection, but I think I find a couple more that are a little bit more direct. Okay, such as when we read, prepare the way the Lord, it said, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Okay, so how's that connected to this week's portion? Well, if you go read in Deuteronomy 4, verse 41 through 42, the scripture says, Then Moses set apart three cities in the east beyond the Jordan, that the manslayer might flee there. Anyone who kills his neighbor unintentionally, without being at enmity with him in past time, he may flee to one of these cities and save his life. Okay, so that does not seem to be very connected with every valley being lifted up, unless we connect it from a different source. Okay, so we know these cities of refuge were being set up. There would be three primary ones on the east side of the Jordan and three on the west side of the Jordan. And then in the Messianic era, there will be an additional three. Okay, but these cities were set up as a place of refuge for someone to go and seek shelter under the covering of the high priest when they had inadvertently killed someone such that they would not die from the one who was seeking to avenge the blood. And so they could, they could go to these places and then they would remain in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. And at that point in time, they were free and they could leave the city. If, any time before, if at any time before the high priest died, if they tried to leave the city, their life was no longer safe. Okay? But as long as they were in the city under the covering, then they were protected. So the reason why the cities of refuge are connected to the idea of making straight in the desert a highway for our God is that the Sanhedrin... Uh, the rulings of the land were that the court was obligated to straighten the roads that led to the cities of refuge, to repair them, and to broaden them. They had to remove all the obstacles and impediments that were on those roads in order to make it so that the one who was fleeing for refuge could get there easily. So they would build bridges over any natural barriers so that they could speed the way. They were essentially raising up the valleys. They were clearing the paths, right? They were preparing the way for the one who needed refuge to find the covering of the high priest, right? They were, they were preparing the way of God's provision, right? To make it easy to attain. And the width of a road to a city of refuge, they said should be not less than 32 cubits. 32 cubits, that's about 50 feet wide. That's a pretty good size road, I think. But anyway, but, and then they also, at all the crossroads, they would put up a sign that would say, refuge, refuge, pointing the direction that they should go. So that if one is fleeing, it was easy. They didn't have to come to a crossroad and figure out where to go. They could see very quickly. So they wouldn't be hindered in any way. And that's, that's all these, uh, these rules were stated in the Mishnah Torah, which were the law, under the laws regarding murder and the preservation of life. Okay, so these were laws regarding someone had killed, someone had murdered, but unintentionally. And now how do we still preserve life in the midst of that? And so these commands were, in a, were, were set up for preserving life, making it accessible to those who were in need. It's a really neat picture when we think about the covering that we have in Yeshua, who is our high priest. And how he's been raised up so that all might see him and come to him. 
Okay, so, so that's one way of a connection. And then secondly, preparing the way of Hashem, preparing the way of the Lord. So we saw that in the wilderness, prepare a way of the Lord, make straight the, the ways to get there. But now preparing the way of the Lord, that comes back to what I mentioned earlier from Deuteronomy 5 in verses 32 to 33. The scripture here says, this is wrapping up the second uh, speech that Moses was giving. He said, you shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. And so this is the, on the entire way, and the Bechol Haderek, you shall go. So a few questions that came up to me on this were, well, what is the way of the Lord? And even if we go a step further into the simplicity of the question, well, what is a way in general? Okay. So the way is the Hebrew word. Actually, okay, derech is the Hebrew word. Okay. But ha derech would be the way. Okay. Ha being the, uh, meaning the word the. But so derech can mean multiple things. It can mean path, way, road, journey, even the direction. But it has literal meanings, but also has figurative meanings. And the figurative meanings can be what is the course of life. You know, the way could be the course of life or the mode of action. Okay? So if we were to think about this on the entire way, that the Lord your God commanded you, shall you, shall you go? I mean, sure, we could look at it as, as a road and a, and a journey that we're taking along the way. But the entire way that God has commanded you is what is the course of the life he has called you to live? What is the mode of action he has called you to walk out? And within, within this portion, in the, in the context of this portion... He's saying you shall walk according to all the commands that he has given you. Those which make sense to man, those which don't make sense to man, those which serve for justice, and those which order our life. And when we look at this, this idea of the way of the Lord being how has he called us to live, we recognize that it's his commandments that he's called us to live by. But it goes beyond just the commandments that he's called us to live by. And a connection here that we can make as well to what is the way God has called us to live by. Yeshua himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, in John 14, 1 through 6, Yeshua says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Here it is. You know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Right? He's thinking of what's the journey? What's the direction to get to the place that you're talking about? But Yeshua is saying, no, you know the way to get to where I'm going. Well, where is he going? He's going to the Father. Okay? Yeshua said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he just told Thomas right there, he's like, I'm going to the Father, right? I'm going to the Father, and you know the way. You know the way because it's been given to you through Moses. It's been demonstrated through my life and my teachings, is what Yeshua is telling him. Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. And then he goes on to, to in continuing in this, in verse 12, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, 
and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Now, in this passage, there's a couple ways we can understand what's, what's Yeshua talking about. Often in, in, uh, from a spiritual perspective, people say, well, look at what were the works that Yeshua was doing? Well, he was performing healings and miracles by the power of the Spirit. You know, and so he's talking about that we too have the ability, the capability to walk in those same things by the power of the Spirit. So he's talking about those things, but he's also talking about all the other things that he does, right? Walking in covenant faithfulness before God, living a life of prayer, of fasting, of service, of compassion, right? He's saying that whoever believes in me will do all, will do the works that I do and greater works than these. Right? So he's covering the whole spectrum with what we would do. And then if we continue on in verse 21, he says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. All right, so in this passage... He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Later on, he says, whoever will keep my word is the one who loves me, right? The commandments and his word, he's putting a parallel with. They're, they're associated with one another. The, and Yeshua's commandments, of course, are the commandments of God. He says that what I'm telling you comes directly from God. So he's calling them back to faithfulness to the commandments and faithfulness to him such that those who are following him, those who are believing in him, can be with the Father. If we were to take this back to the progression of the three speeches that Moses is giving in Deuteronomy, I think we see a parallel here too, right? We started with, um, with this destiny that Moses was saying the children of Israel had, the inheritance they were to go and take hold of, followed by, this is the covenant, remember it. God didn't just make it with your forefathers, he made it with you. And that's actually, here in Deuteronomy 5, he actually said, not with our fathers, not with your fathers did he make it, but with you. Now, of course, God made it with the fathers too, but he made it with them. He's saying it's renewed with you. Hey, so he's saying, walk in covenant faithfulness. Here's your destiny. Now, remember the covenant so that you can walk in faithfulness to it. And when you walk in faithfulness to it, you're demonstrating your love for God such that you can be with God. Right? That's what it said here at the beginning. So, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's the oneness. It's the progression of Yeshua saying, I'm going to make a place for you. I'm going to make the ultimate promised land for you. I'm preparing the way and I'm going to bring you there with me. That's Deuteronomy chapter 4, just in a different context. Deuteronomy 5, keep my commandments. And then Deuteronomy 6, with the love of God and the unity with God. So you have here in John 14, you have the picture of the promise, the calling. And then what is the end goal? We talked about it a few weeks ago in, uh, when we were talking about the spirit of the law. We talked about how the Torah is not the goal. The unity with God, the transformation of being with him, knowing him, becoming more like him, that's the goal. That's what this is all leading up to the oneness with God, the love of God, and having his abode with us. Us in him, right? And he in us. And that's what, uh, in John 17, 
when Yeshua was praying in some of his last hours, he was praying for unity, both within the people, within the followers, and unity between God and man. And in, in John 17, 3, he says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Yeshua Messiah, whom you have sent. Right? He says that life is knowing God, knowing him experientially, not knowing of him, but encountering him in a way that is transformative. And then later on in this chapter, he, he speaks about the future glory. He speaks about the oneness. And so when, when Yeshua says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he is the way in which we're to walk. He's the one who opened the door so that we might pass through. It is through him that we know what truth is. And passing through that gate and walking according to his truth brings us into everlasting life. He's the one who brings us out of darkness and into light. Now, Along the ways of what is the, the way that we're to live, the life that we're to live, John repeats essentially some of these same concepts in the book of First John, saying, you know, we need to abide by his commandments, keep his word. And yes, here in First John 2, In verse 6, he says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, it can be a tendency, a tendency of us to say, well, how did Yeshua walk? And we say, well, he walked according to Torah, and that's how we should all walk. And yes, we should live by the Torah. I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't. But there's extensions, essentially, of what was his walk that made the Torah alive in him? Was it just that he went to synagogue at all the right times, that he memorized the scripture, that he went up to Jerusalem at all the three pilgrimage festivals? No, there was so much more to who he was. That was an important part of his faithfulness and his walk. But Yeshua walked in the power of the Spirit because he availed himself to the Spirit. He knew the Father's heart and could speak what he heard from the Father because he spent time with God in prayer, in isolation, through fasting, setting aside all the things of the earth, all the things that could be a hindrance and a blockage. So that the way of the Lord could be prepared in him, so that he could go on to walk in his in his call to accomplish the mission God had given him. He was looking for the way to be manifest in him completely. And Back here in verse 6 when he says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Have you ever heard people say, how's your walk? Sometimes that confuses people. And they're like, well, they got a little hitch. You know, or what do you mean, how's my walk? And it's like, well, how's your walk with the Lord? Right, because it's supposed to be a relational thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not, how's your checklist? It's how's your walk? Because you're going to walk in with him repeatedly, back and forth, with someone you love, someone who loves you. And it's called a walk because it takes movement, it takes action. It doesn't just happen. Spiritual growth isn't passive. Tikkun olam, the restoration of the world, isn't passive. 
And so we're called to, to action, to, to persevere, to pursue God. And so um, some of the practices that we do along the way in this pursuit, of course, is learning Torah. That was, that's one thing that shows up over and over in this week's portion is to teach the word, the command to teach the word and for the people to learn it. So there's the carrying out the commandments, to walk in faithfulness, to know what the commandments are so that we may keep them, to observe the Sabbath, to rest in God's presence, to meet him at the time that he said that he would be available to us, that he would encounter us. But what else? As I mentioned before, there's, there's prayer. And, and there's, there's, there's different kinds of prayer, right? Can you pray while you're driving down the road? Yes, but keep your eyes open. Okay. But yes, absolutely, that can be great times of prayer and encounter with God. Can you, you can pray at any time, right, and in all circumstances. But there's something qualitatively different about uninterrupted, undistracted prayer. Now, if you're at a place in life where you can't do that because you've got kids running all over the place and you've got all kinds of things to do, that's okay. This is the season. Be faithful to the best of your ability in this time. God will meet you in that time, right? But if you can carve out the time to sit and be quiet, removing the distractions and open up the airways, practicing listening to God, that's going to take you to a different level, right? And so the solitude, the prayer, the fasting, which removes physical encumbrances, enabling the spirit to flourish, is part of seeking God in this oneness and the way, okay? Other ways that we walk in the way is practicing generosity, actively being part of a community that helps one another, supports one another, serving in the community. And then also even the witness of how we live our life, right? All of these things come together in what is the way and what is the way in which Yeshua walked. He walked in all of these things, right? So we shouldn't become overly fixated on one of them, right? But to say, okay, Lord, how do I walk in these? How do I grow in these? Lord, I'm not very good at fasting. Help me with fasting. Help me to understand it. Help me to see the beauty in it that I can encounter in it. Or perhaps my life isn't being the witness that I know that it should be because I walk around at work all day and I'm grumpy, <laughs> right? Or, or that I don't show the compassion that Yeshua showed. All these ways in which we can grow, but all for the pursuit of saying, Lord, how can you be manifest more in me day by day such that I know you better? You know me inside and out, right? God knows each of us inside and out. But if we were to know him in all of those parts as well, that's a different thing. You know, in Jeremiah 6, 16, this is one that we, uh, the scripture we like to look to, it says, thus says the Lord, stand by the way and look, ask for the ancient paths, where, is the, where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Right, this is kind of a short summary of what we're saying. When you look at this, the, the word Derek is used twice, stand by the derech and look, ask for the ancient paths, which is a different word, where the, where the good derek is and walk in it, okay? Stand by the way, St so it's stand by or in the commandments, stand by or in the way that's been shown to you, look for what has been revealed and now finding it Walk all the more in it. Walk all the more in it, and that will bring rest to your souls. And another one in Isaiah 30, verse 21. I love this one because we're so in need of the Spirit, right? Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. 
when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. So think about this. When you turn to the, to the, to the left or to the right is generally spoken of, of turning away from God's commandments. But then to have the Spirit come and check you say, no, 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 this is the way. Walk in it. He always seeks to call us back. He always seeks to call us back so that it may go well for us, so that he may do good to us, and we may, we may live long in the land and prosper. And when I say this, the land, I'm just speaking of what God has apportioned for us in our lives in this day. Because he's poured out blessings and he desires to pour out more. And he says, this is the way. Walk in it so it may go well for you. That's another thing that's repeated over and over in this week's portion is so it may go well for you. And the reason why is because God desires to do good for his people. That's why Isaiah 1 through 39 was all rebuke and calling people to turn back and warning of destruction. It was for the hope that the destruction could be averted if the people would just turn and walk in the way so they could prosper and not result in exile, not find themselves in exile. A big part of this, I, I uh, want to turn to John 15. Yeshua's words in his final hours are so magnificent, right? Here in the book of John. Chapters 14 through 17. Um, but in John 15, Yeshua says in verse 4, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he continues on with much more of the theme here that we're talking about of, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy shall be made full. Just as it's the Father's heart to see the world redeemed, it's Yeshua's heart to see the world redeemed. So much so that he would give his life for it. And he says, take my words and place them in your heart. Listen to my words, for they are life. And that's what his disciples say. They say, they say you have the words of everlasting life. You have the words of life. They're in you. And he says, I've given you these words so that your joy may be made full. So that your exile would be turned to redemption. So that the promises of God be, may be manifest in your life and not lost. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now listen to that verse 14. Are you a friend of God? Right? Sometimes I hear that, uh, or I have in years past, you know, like that, hey, we, we're called a friend of God, no longer slaves, it's all good. It's like, well, okay, have you done the part that he said would be required for you to be called a friend? Or did you, have you just believed and haven't actually walked the path? There's a difference. I'm not trying to make little of faith because, you know, the first step is believing. Okay, but it's called the first step. Okay, and it's the first step. And then you walk in faithfulness and you grow and you become a friend of God, no longer a slave. And as you grow in faithfulness and friendship with God, he continues to promote you, right? He says, if you're faithful in little, You'll be faithful in much. And as you're faithful, I will give you more to manage. I'll give you more to walk in. And in this, you become a friend of God. And then 
you become one with God. It's the, again, it's the progression. It's the stepwise progression of salvation. It's the stepwise progression of what he's calling us to and the hope that we have, the hope revealed in Yeshua. And he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Right? His desire is the fruit remains. Right? Not for it to be lost, not for it to be trampled. And the key to the fruit remaining is remaining in the vine who makes us fruitful in the first place. Keeping our eyes fixed on Yeshua. And trusting that he will bring us to where, to where we are going. Um, one more passage. Um, with this idea is um, Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. This statement is not a limitation on who can find the narrow gate. It's saying how many are going to seek true union with God to pursue him on the way that he has given us such that they can come to the place of entering into the gate of deep relationship. You know, you think about gates. And the city of Jerusalem has gates to enter by. But then the Temple Mount itself has gates to enter by. And then there's even the gate into the holy place. There's a progression of gates that you can enter by. Each one taking you closer and closer to the presence of God. And he says, walk along the way with an understanding of who I've called you to be, the destination that I've said you, I will bring you to. Walk according to my ways and faithfulness and enter into the gates of his presence where there's fullness of joy. Yeshua is the gate. He's the door by which we enter. He's the one who establishes the covenant and, is, and it will return in glory. And when he returns in glory, it says that words are written on his thigh that say faithful and true. Faithful and true written on his thigh. What else is on his thigh if he's riding a horse? Okay. If he's riding a horse, then what's on his thigh would be the corners of his garment. Could be his seat seat, which represent the covenant, represent the commandments, represent what is faithful and true. Okay? And when he returns, he's going to be vanquishing every enemy, removing every, every obstacle that pe keep people from pursuing God. He's going to make the way for the Father to come at the end of the thousand year reign. Right, what we read in Revelation 21, I believe. So once again, we have the door. The one who makes our destiny open to us. Because without him, there is no way for the destiny to be opened up, up to people. Their life is only by his provision. And then he's the one who comes in, the, in, in power to establish the covenant in its fullness and to make the way for our oneness with the Father. The one who leads us into life everlasting. And if he's the one who does all these things and he's the one who has perfectly demonstrated to us the way that God desires his people to live, then it's so much more powerful when we think about how John said that we ought to walk as he walked in all of these things.
You know, when we think about uh, steps and the life and the health that it brings to our bodies, to our spirits, it brings a whole new uh, perspective to, have you gotten your steps in today? <laughs> you know, we count our steps for health-wise, but um, have you gotten your steps in today? It's so much more than a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And walking in the ways of God so that we can see him manifest in us. So that it will go well for us and we, we may live long in his promises. Amen. So may we pursue him, our eyes fixed on Yeshua each step of the way. Anybody have anything that you wanted to share? Um, I just, um, as you were preaching the very first verse that you read from Isaiah, or one of the very first verses, um, as you read that, that really gave me like this vivid, Im- vivid image in my spirit. Um, 40, Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4, where it spoke about how everything shall align itself is what I gathered, right? Everything shall align itself to Abba's word. Right, um, everything shall be made straight. And as you continue to preach, um, I thought about this one verse that I always had a question on. I'm like, well, why did he do that? Um, and it, it's uh, Matthew 21 verse 19. Um, and I think it for me it tied in to what you said and what you preached today, um, where it says, "And seeing a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves." only. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you forever. And immediately the fig tree withered. And I was like, well, why was he upset that the fig tree didn't have, you know, what he needed? Um, But in listening to this teaching today, the perspective that I got from it was, you know, he's the master, he's the king. And it's, I I think, like, because he was before it, it should have had it should, have, it should have given the fruit that it was created to give. Um, and then I kept reading, and it talked about moving forward, how um, if you tell this valley to move and the mountain to move, so I don't know, that kind of resonated with some of the verses you um, preached. But, um, but yeah, I just, I don't know, that came to mind. I don't know if it ties in, but, yeah, it's just kind of like a question. Yeah, yeah. Um... It is interesting about the, the, the fig tree. Um, it's often thought of as being a example, well, it, it was to metaphorical of saying that Israel at the time was the fig tree that was barren and their time of judgment had come. And so because they were not found fruitful, the exile was coming, it was primarily the understanding of what was taking place there with, with that fig tree, but what would fruitfulness look like? It would look like faithfulness and not just walking the commandments, but also actually having a transformation of the heart. They say, uh, the sages say that the second temple was just destroyed on the account of baseless hatred. Okay, well, there were many people, many people walking according to the Torah at the time, but was the heart transformed such that they were actually walking in love where they you know they hadn't arrived at the third step there of taking it from and when I say they I'm talking in broad terms right especially from the leadership of of the people but it was it was a statement looking at the leaders should have been abiding in love but they were not and it, because they were not it did not they were not producing fruit and were therefore going to come under judgment. But, so it is connected from this, this idea of what will abiding and truly walking with a transformed heart result in. It will result in fruit that lasts. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, you read the verses where the master was saying you will do greater works than these, right? Um, and then you mentioned as to how do we get to that place? And it is walking the same way that our master walked, right? But how is it that the master was so close to God? I know people say, well, he is God in flesh, and that's great. But if you really look at his life, 
he didn't just walk around saying, well, I'm God and it's all good and I don't have to do anything else and here's power to show off, right? But he was constantly connecting with God, yeah. right? He was constantly connecting with the Father. And I mean, if the Word made flesh has to do this, right? And he prayed all night. And then we say, well, now I got seven kids, I'm busy. Well, that's great. How many disciples was he taking care of? You know, and it's easy to come up with excuses. That's all they are. I mean, if you have time to get on Facebook, to read fiction, watch a show, you have zero excuse, right? Um, the expectation, I know in first century Christianity was like a minimum, what, three prayer three times a day? And not the driving in your car type prayer, right? Even right. though that's obviously always have conversations with God. But there's like three dedicated times of prayer a day, meditating on the word of God every day. Um, obviously, they didn't each have a Bible in hand, but they would recall the words from synagogue, right? And recall the words in their mind and ponder it. That was expected daily. And I mean, I know King David talked about that. Um, and then the Didache shows us fasting twice a week, right? And then we see the master's example of praying all night long. I mean, if we want God to shine out in us, we have a very clear example of how we connect. And it's not easy, but excuses aren't good enough. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, yeah, it, it, takes, it takes dedication. It takes a, a desire of a pursuit. It's, yeah. I, I didn't want to say the word lifestyle because lifestyle has various, uh, various levels. I mean, because you can have a casual lifestyle of walking with God or you can have a pursuing, like a true pursuit. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, we bless your name and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that you've given us the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, and that you have shown us the path to walk on. And that by your spirit, Lord, you guide us so that we may stay on the path for our good. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would speak to us and uh, just call us forward, Lord. Call us forward that we would know what the next step is for each one of us individually, how we can grow in faithfulness and how we can grow in, in unity with you and love. Father, we bless you and we give you praise in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this message, please consider sharing it with a friend or family member and help us out by giving a review on iTunes or other podcast platform. Check out our website at walkingemmausroad.org for additional teachings and information about visiting Emmaus Road in Kingwood, Texas.